This is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to look at the subject of letting the Lord's light lead. Do you let the Lord's light lead you and guide you? If you do, then you will not faint. In 2 Corinthians 4.1, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And Proverbs 24.10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. But if the joy of the Lord, like Nehemiah 8.10, is your strength, then your strength is big. Ephesians 6.10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Isaiah 40.31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength so 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy we faint not. And Paul says therefore showing you that this still has connection to the previous chapter the very first word in chapter 4 here is therefore showing you it's a connection to what was said in that last chapter. He said seeing we have this ministry Okay, what ministry is he referring to? Well, look back at chapter 3. And in chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So it's that New Testament ministry. 2 Corinthians 4.1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy. Paul received just as much mercy as anybody. I mean, look at what he did in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 13. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So he did a lot of bad things, yet he obtained mercy. He received mercy. And Paul finished his course. He didn't faint in all the persecution that he faced because he let the Lord's light lead ever since he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? When he was on the road to Damascus, he saw a big light just come up in front of him and it blinded him. And he let the Lord's light lead ever since. Notice another reason Paul doesn't faint is because his mind isn't on himself, but on the Lord and on others. He says in verse 5 that we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. He knows it's not all about him, but about Jesus Christ and about others. And then in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 15, he lets the Corinthians know why he does things. He says in verse 15, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause you faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So if you want to be happy and find power and strength and keep going without fainting, then quit making everything about you and make it about others. Let the Lord's light lead. He also isn't fainting because he knows that this life is temporal and that what matters is eternal. If he has to get beat down and, and spit on and mocked, then he knows it's temporal and not something that's going to last forever. Notice how even though he goes through horrible things in this life, he's not going to faint. He's letting the Lord's light lead. He said in 2 Corinthians 4.8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So he's troubled, but he's not distressed. He's not perplexed, that is confused or baffled, but in despair. Not, but not in despair. In verse 9 it says, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Paul was persecuted. He said in 2 Timothy 3, 2, All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But yet Paul wasn't forsaken. 
Even when he was beaten with rods, as he says in 2 Corinthians 11.35, the Lord didn't forsake him and was right there with him. All Paul was doing was following the pattern that the Lord left for him, and he did it without fainting. He's letting the Lord's light lead. He said in 2 Corinthians 4.10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Paul lived godly and kept going through adversity, and he showed the light that was in him, making it manifest in his body. That means he made it open to the world, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. He lived such a godly life, people could see Jesus in him. 2 Corinthians 4, 11 through 12 For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Paul knew that this mortal flesh is dead, and his mind was on an eternal glorified body, eternal rewards, and an eternal home with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he doesn't faint. His mind isn't on the temporal. It is on the eternal. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Anything that might make him faint on this world is much, nothing more than a light affliction. Paul was put in prison for preaching the gospel. And he says that is nothing. It, it's a light affliction. Being put in prison is nothing. It's just a light affliction. And these light afflictions are nothing compared to the glory that we are going to get in eternity if we've suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ here. So he says in verse 17 of chapter 4, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's only a moment, the suffering, but it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. These light afflictions work for us. I mean, they it's like they're our employees. They're working for us. You think that they're in control when you're in the middle of suffering, but it's you that's gaining. It's you that's gaining something. 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, Say some guy cussed you out when you were preaching the gospel. Just say, thanks, you're working for me. Your light affliction is just giving me a greater reward in eternity. The Lord is so smart that he fixed it to where your afflictions work for you. And if you're letting the Lord's light lead, then it shows you things above. You're going to see things above. Second Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All these light afflictions and things that tempt us to faint are just temporal. We are getting a glorified body that's going to shine, and the light of the Lord gives you a little glimpse of that in this life. And I love it when the Lord reminds me of what's to come and gives me a little glimpse. Maybe when I'm reading the Bible, reading a, a Bible story or something, it just smacks me right in the face that all this is just so real and soon i'm going to get a glorified body we're going to be living in the millennial kingdom and it's going to be the this better than we could ever imagine and if the lord light if the lord's light leads you then you'll see that you need to be thinking on things above on the eternal things and if the lord lord's light leads you You'll be a believer and not a deceiver. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So renounced means disowned or rejected. Paul is saying he rejects the hidden things of dishonesty. Something might appear godly, but it's actually a lie. And this is because Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Every man is a liar. 
He, sometimes he may appear godly, but he's a liar. Psalms 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. And they walk in craftiness. They handle the word of God deceitfully. But if you're a believer and not a deceiver, and you're letting the Lord's light lead you, then whatever the Bible says settles the argument for you. You're not going to handle it in unrighteousness. Like it says in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There are really educated men out there that they get the Bible, they got it in their hand, they hold it in unrighteousness because they set out to change it. These men walk in craftiness. They handle the Word of God deceitfully. They see what they can change or take out of context so that it fits their belief or makes them look better. But they're not Bible believers. But if you let the Lord's light lead, then it leads you to faith in the book and not faith in your own intellect. And some men think they are smart enough to correct what God says and therefore handle the word of God deceitfully. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. Many times people that I train at work, uh, they think they know more about the job than I do, even though they just started. And I'm always confused by that. And then it's like God says, why are you so surprised? They think that they know more than me, and I'm God. And sometimes we think we know more than God, even though he's been around longer. He made us. I mean, he sees the beginning from the ending, so why would I think I know more than God does? Men who change the Bible are letting the light lead. They think they know more than God. They think they're smart enough to correct what God said. They let their flesh lead because their flesh wants to promote itself. And the more they reject the leading of the light, the more the light goes out. Now look at verse 13 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. So the best preachers to listen to are the ones who truly believe what they are saying. Some preachers say there is no perfect Bible for today. Uh, this one guy was using several different verse, uh, versions of the Bible in his sermon and talked about how people need to be excited about reading the Bible. And I'm sitting there thinking, how can they get excited about the Bible if you're teaching them that there isn't a perfect Bible? Because you're using more than one version. And if someone uses more than one version of the Bible, all the versions say something different. They can't all be right. So that shows that person does not believe that God preserved his word and that there is a perfect Bible for today. Or he would just be using one Bible. You have all these versions. Only one of them can be right because they all say something different. And that's the King James Bible. Paul says, I have, I have believed and therefore have I spoken. You never hear Paul talk about the scripture that he had needing correction. But you hear how he says we need correction and how he is imperfect. That's who needs correction. The Word of God is profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The book doesn't need correction. We need correction. Paul says, I, I have believed and therefore have I spoken. He believes the words and he speaks the words. Now back up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If someone doesn't know the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection, then they don't know the first thing about salvation. <coughs> if someone doesn't know the gospel, then they don't know why they need to be saved. They don't know they're a sinner, but that's part of the gospel is the fact that Jesus died for our sins and they don't know what saves them if they don't know the gospel. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 shows you the gospel. And it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which you also received, till that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So have you believed the gospel? Or do you, do you attempt to say that Jesus didn't really die? 
because some people do teach that. Do you teach that he didn't really resurrect because some men also teach that? Or do you teach that Jesus Christ wasn't perfect because men like Don Lemon said that he wasn't perfect? Are you a believer of the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, or are you a deceiver? The question for you, if you deny any of the gospel right now is, not are you letting the light lead, but have you even let the light in? You need to be worried about letting, if you've let the light in, before you worry about letting it lead, because it can't lead unless you've let it in. And there's a lot of people that think they're saved, but they don't even know the gospel. They don't know why they needed a savior. They don't know what saves them, and they don't have the light in. They have darkness. And 2 Corinthians 4, 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now notice that word hid. And I want to take you to the verses where Jesus Christ explains the gospel to his disciples before the gospel even took place. Luke 18, 31 through 34 says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And on the third day he shall rise again. Now that's the gospel that he just explained to the disciples. And look what happens in verse 34. It says, And they understood none of these things. And this saying was... Look at the word, hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So Jesus Christ told the disciples about his death and resurrection. And what does it say? They understood none of these things. The saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So the gospel at that time was hid from the disciples. And 2 Corinthians 4, 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So does this mean the disciples were lost? Definitely not. You see, this is where right division comes in. I'm not going to put 2 Corinthians 4, 3 on the disciples because the disciples at that time were not even under the New Testament yet and the events of the gospel hadn't even taken place yet. See, the, the disciples... They didn't have that knowledge revealed to them yet. God has to, everything in the Bible, God has to reveal it to you. And the disciples walked and talked with Jesus, but they didn't understand the gospel. It's not that they were lost. It's not that they didn't believe the Lord like they should. It's because it was hid from them. Before Jesus died, the New Testament hadn't even started yet. Hebrews 9, 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So you can't put 2 Corinthians 4, 3, you can't take that back and put it on the disciples before the, before the death, burial, and resurrection. That's wrong division. Just like a lot of things in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, I can't move forward and put it on me in the New Testament. It's right division. We believe all the Bible. We believe that we can get something out of every verse in the Bible, but not every verse applies to each person who ever lived. Some apply to people in a different age. That's right division. Never forget the proper divisions of the Bible. Even if you don't like to be referred to as a dispensationalist, you still need to recognize proper, proper divisions in the Scripture. So are you a believer or a deceiver? If you're letting the Lord's light lead, then you're a believer. And the God of this world doesn't have the blinders on you. Sometimes he likes to pull the wool over the eyes of the sheep. Now, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, <coughs> In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So the God of this world is the devil himself. He blinds minds. He puts the blinders over the eyes of the sheep, turns them into a deceiver and not a believer. And Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. The devil has blinded someone mind, someone's mind there. 
But Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if you've had the blinders on your mind for years, get out the Bible, be not conformed to this world, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is a believer and a deceiver. He believes the Lord's light will lead you to the right way, but he doesn't want you to even let the Lord's light in your soul. He doesn't want you to believe that Jesus Christ is the image of God. Paul plainly shows us that he is. In Colossians 1.15, he says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And Jesus even said himself in John 14.9, Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? But the devil will put doubt and deception in your path because he doesn't want you to see Jesus Christ on your road to Damascus like Paul did. Jesus appears to Paul as a bright light. In Acts uh, 26, 13 through 15, it says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. That's when Jesus shined in Nepal. Jesus Christ shines unto you. Malachi 4.2 calls him the son of righteousness. Revelation 1.16 says his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And the devil wants to counterfeit this and appears as an angel of light, as it says in 2 Corinthians 11.14. And he wants to blind the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The light shined unto Paul. Paul took the blinders off, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he preached the gospel and was a faithful Christian for the rest of his life. He let the Lord's light lead from the moment that he saw it on the road to Damascus. If you let the Lord's light lead, you'll realize it's the Lord's world and you're just living in it. That's the next point. The devil is only the God of this world because the Lord lets him be. The world is still the Lord's and he is the one that made it it's his world, you're just living in it. And if you let the Lord's light lead, then you'll see you're nothing, and he is everything. You'll see it as a privilege to be alive and breathing and able to walk around on the world that God made. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So if you're the creature, and God is the creator, then you're weaker, and God is greater. So why would you preach about you? Paul says, for we preach not ourselves. Why exalt yourselves or do things that would cause you to get the glory? Paul preached the Lord Jesus Christ. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And he was a servant to the Corinthians for Jesus' sake. Paul served others because he loved Jesus Christ. Jesus served others and Paul was following his pattern. He realized it's the Lord's world. He's just living in it. Romans 15, 3, For even Christ pleased not himself. So the advice a lot of people give is think about yourself first. Make sure that you're happy. Uh, that's horrible advice. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So God that commanded the light to shine out of darkness. This takes you all the way back to Genesis 1 through 3 at the creation. God just said, let there be light, and there was light. Just like when you got saved, you were without form and void on the inside. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. But when you got born again, the Lord put the light in. He turned the light on for you. So verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
So you need to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That is, you need to give people the knowledge of the truth of the gospel that is found only in the face of Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You can't get saved any other way. He's the only way. Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The treasure in earthen vessels is the light that God shined in you when you got born again. That is the excellent thing, and that is the real power. Some men are bodybuilders, and that power is of them. Some men are real good in music, and it has power. And influence over people but the true power is of god and not of us and if you let the light of the lord lead you then you'll see the power is of god and not of you and if you're saved it's in you because god is in you the more talent and beauty and smarts and gifts a person has the more hard it is for them to realize that the power is of god and the harder it is to realize that they need to let the lord the Lord's light lead. Romans 1 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 1 Corinthians 1 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Ephesians 16, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So are you letting the Lord's light lead?